Welcome to this session. My name is Timothy Paul Jones, and I serve as a professor of apologetics at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and I've got the privilege of serving here as a preaching pastor at Sojourn Church Midtown here in Louisville. And I want to thank you, first off, for reading the book In Church As It Is In Heaven and for participating in this study. We don't take your time lightly, and we're, we're very thankful for you. Now, you've probably already noticed, and Jamal's already talked about how we've structured this book according to a worship service a worship service much like we would practice here at Sojourn Church Midtown just on a typical Sunday morning. And here's what that means practically, that it starts out with a call to worship, which is then followed by a time of confession and lament. And these two movements of call to worship and then confession and lament point to two realities, two things about creation itself. And it's simply this, that the creation around us is marked by both beauty and by brokenness. And so these two themes are beauty and brokenness. Call to worship points to beauty and confession and lament point to brokenness. And so just remember, think about this fact that before the first human beings sinned, that everything for humanity was beautiful and good. And then when humanity rebelled against God, what the result of that was is that brokenness descended upon God's creation. The good didn't go away, the beautiful didn't go away, but all that had been so beautiful and so good became able to be distorted, disfigured, misused. There was a privation that entered into God's creation. And so in our call to worship, what we're doing is we are recognizing that all the beauty that remains in God's creation, and there is so much beauty that is left in God's creation, but all that beauty that's left in God's creation is only there because of the beauty and the all-surpassing glory of God. That beauty that is in creation is only there because God is so much more beautiful than we can ask or imagine. But then that part of confession and lament, what we're doing at that point is we are admitting, recognizing the reality of brokenness and sin in the world. And so this session is about confession and lament. And here's what I want to do with you in this session, I want to do together, is to make space for all of us to be able to lament the realities of racial injustice in our world. Now, some of you, as soon as I say that, as soon as I say we are going to lament the realities of racial injustice in our world, your first feeling and thought is, hey, I'm not racist. Why do I need to lament anything? I'm not a racist person. Why do I need to lament? And what I want to say to you gently but firmly at this point is, if that's your reaction, you're confusing repenting with lamenting. That's what you've done is you've confused repentance with lament. You see, no one can or should repent of any sin they didn't actually commit. Nobody should. Nobody can. We learn that in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 30, in which it's very clear in the words of the prophet Jeremiah that every person is responsible for his or her own sins. But all of us should be ready to lament. We should be able to lament how sin and injustice have impacted people's lives, especially when those people are our sisters and our brothers in Christ. Lament is deeply and richly biblical, particularly when that lament is something that has affected, is over something that has affected our brothers and our sisters in Christ. We see an example of this even in the Old Testament, a sort of a template that's being laid out for it in the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 9. Think through Daniel chapter 9. It's a prayer of Daniel, probably prayed around 539 or 538 BC, and it's at a time when Daniel has looked back, and it's about 50 years after the time when the temple was destroyed, the temple fell, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. It's about 50 years after that, and Daniel has realized there are 20 more years of an exile that his people are going to experience. And as he looks on this history, both past and future, he, he just settles in with this sense of lament, and he laments what he sees. And here is part of his lament in Daniel chapter 9 and 
verse eight, it says, to us, O Lord, belongs open shame to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned. Now notice something in Daniel's words in Daniel chapter nine there. He's not repenting of any particular personal sin that he has committed. He is lamenting the past and present sins of his people. That's what he's doing at that point. That's what we're talking about here, is being able to lament the past and present sins and their impact that they've had on people's lives and the brokenness that sin has introduced into our world. That's lament. And Christians throughout church history have recognized the need for this kind of lament. Let me give you simply one example from the year 1645. The Westminster Assembly produced what was called a directory for public worship. And here is one of the prayers that they included in their directory for public worship. They said, we acknowledge our great sinfulness by reason of actual sins, our own sins, the sins of magistrates, of ministers, and of the whole nation unto which we are many ways accessory. Do you see what they're doing there? That in the 17th century is a lament that includes a confession, yes, of personal sin, but it goes beyond personal sin to lament the sins of the nation, of its leaders, and of the impact that those sins have had on people's lives. We see that in the history of the Southern Baptist Convention. If you don't know about this, the Southern Baptist Convention was founded in 1845 for the express purpose of sending slaveholders as missionaries. And in 1995, the Southern Baptist Convention lamented that. They lamented the impact of the denomination's support of chattel slavery. And here are the words that they spoke as part of this. We lament and repudiate historic acts of evil, such as slavery, from which we continue to reap a bitter harvest. And we recognize that the racism which yet plagues our culture today is inextricably tied to the past. So no, you can't repent of a sin you didn't commit, but all of us should be ready to lament sin's impact on people's lives. You see, sins of racial injustice have impacted all of our lives in different ways, and they continue to do so. And that gives us all a reason to lament. And so what we are lamenting here is the impact of injustice on people's lives, the impact of injustice. But what I want us to think about as we look at that, as we consider injustice, we need to ask ourselves biblically and theologically, what is justice? What is justice? Well, Old Testament scholar Peter Gentry has developed a deeply and richly biblical understanding of the notion of justice between human beings. And he's grounded it in the book of Isaiah, the prophecies of Isaiah. And something you see in the book of Isaiah is this couplet, these two words, justice and righteousness, or justice and right, occur together 18 different times in the book of Isaiah. And you see an example of this, for example, in Isaiah 1, 17, where it says, do, do righteousness, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. You see there that justice and right are put together. Now, here's what Peter Gentry argues. He argues that this is the Bible's expression of social justice, which as he looks at Isaiah, what he recognizes is that social justice biblically ought to be defined as treating one another in genuinely human ways and living as godly stewards of economic and environmental resources. So notice here biblically what justice has to do with. It has to do with human dignity and it has to do with godly stewardship of resources. That's the first thing, the first aspect we might say of what justice means biblically and theologically. It has to do with dignity and stewardship. But there's another aspect of it that is in our theological traditions that we ought to recognize, and that is that justice has also been in Christian theology grounded in natural law. That is grounded in what God has woven into creation itself. 
And for that, we can look back to two 19th century Italian theologians, Luigi Taparelli and Antonio Rosmini. Now for them and for, for Taparelli in particular, justice is defined in terms of natural law that God has woven into creation. Justice is defined as perpetually willing to render someone what they are due. Now, when we follow this biblical theological definition that's grounded in Isaiah, and it's grounded in natural law, and we think about what social justice means or ought to mean, it means that people are treated with dignity and that they receive what they are due. And when we think about that, we have to recognize that for centuries in the United States, African Americans were not and have not been treated with dignity, and they were refused what they were due. Let's just think about those two, those two concepts, dignity and due. In terms of dignity, of course, we first think of, and we ought to think of, how people were held captive as chattel by masters who claimed they could own another human being without any limitations. But even after that, even after slavery, lesser educational opportunities simply because of ethnicity. People were refused advancement in jobs or even access to certain jobs because of ethnicity. That's not being treated with dignity. And so that is a clear example of biblically and theologically speaking, real injustice. When it comes to the second aspect of people receiving what they are due, well, it's even clearer when we look at that. It's even clearer when we consider that. I can just think of the fact that within two miles of where I'm standing right now, African-American families for most of the 20th century were limited to a handful of poorly resourced neighborhoods because they had no other options of where they were allowed to live, not because of anything that they had done, but simply because they were black. They were put in areas where homes were overpriced and people could jack up the rents and jack up the prices of these homes without repairing them, without resourcing them. Why? Because these were the only places where African-American persons in our city were allowed to live. I could have at one time walked to a, a neighborhood, a, a street called Walnut Street, a section of a street called Walnut Street. And if I had walked there, I would have found over a hundred African-American owned businesses in the city that were obliterated in the interest of urban renewal, supposedly. That's people not receiving the benefit of what they are due. I think of the fact that African-American soldiers returning from World War II never received the GI benefits that they had actually earned and they were cut out of education cut out of housing loans. All of these things have had lasting effects on emotional and mental health, on physical health, on economic opportunity. All of these things have had a lasting effect. Injustice occurs whenever somebody is denied dignity and due. And in both of those instances, both of those aspects of what we are understanding justice to be biblically and theologically, we can see that authentic social injustice was done. Now, whenever there has been social injustice, we have seen that there is reason for lament. And that brings us to Romans chapter 12 and verse 15, where it says, weep with those who weep. Weep with those who weep, mourn with those who mourn, lament with those who lament. And this is one of the ways that we fulfill what Paul told the church in Romans to do in Romans 12, 10, where he said, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves, honor one another above yourselves. Do you see what he's saying right there? If somebody else has a place of brokenness in their life, if there is a place for lament in somebody else's life, we are to honor them by us entering into that lament with them. And this is not merely one ethnicity lamenting for another. Rather, it's all of us lamenting for ourselves, for our brothers and sisters, for our nation, for our churches, over the wrongs that have been done 
over the wrongs that have been done and the wrongs that still have an effect on our world today, do you realize that all of us are affected by this? It doesn't matter what neighborhood you live in or what neighborhood you don't, all of us are affected by this, that there is suspicion, there is separation, there is hurt, there is the fact that you don't know people as friends and as neighbors you might have known otherwise because of this legacy of social and racial injustice. And we live in the shadow of this. There's a beauty and a wonder we have missed just because we're not near to one another, because we're separated from one another. And so how should we lament? How should we enter into this sense of lament that I'm describing here? How should we do that? I'm gonna give you two simple things that I want you to think about this week. Number one, learn your story. <laughs> learn your stories. Here's what I mean by that first off. Think about the place where you live. Just think about the place where you live right now. There is a reason why it is the way it is. There may have been in the place where you live, for example, things like lynchings that actually happened in the place where you live. Do you know about that? Have you considered that? Have you wrestled with what that means for your neighborhood, for your community? There is probably segregation of some sort that has happened in your community, or it could be that you realize my entire community is one single ethnicity. There's a reason for that. Explore that. How did it come to that? How did it get to that point? And think about that. That's learning your story. If you're an ethnic minority, one of the ways that you can learn your story is simply by recognizing your own pain that you've experienced, where you can share with other Christians who will understand and listen and care and won't try to downplay the things you describe. Part of learning your story is not just learning the story of your place, it's owning the story of you and of what you've experienced. The second thing I would say after learning your stories is simply learn to lament the stories you learn. Learn to lament these stories. Prayerfully walk some of the places where these injustices have actually taken place and pray and absorb into your soul just the sense, the depth, the darkness of what has happened in the place where you are at. And maybe learn to lament together in a group, maybe in a smaller group at first. And eventually as your church learns and thinks about these things, maybe learn eventually to lament as a church. And I'm gonna let you know something that's probably going to happen. As you learn to lament, you may begin to see some sinful attitudes in you. You see, sometimes we think there's nothing sinful in me. There's no sinful attitudes in me in this area. And then as you lament, you start to realize, I, I am more broken than I ever knew. I am more broken than I ever knew. You may begin to realize that there is racial supremacy in your attitudes that you never knew was there. It may be that you've developed bitterness over hurts that you've experienced. I don't know what it is, but as you lament, God often brings to the surface of your life some things you didn't even know were there. And you need to deal with those, pray through those. And as those come up, what do you do with those? Well, you take them to your Savior. You take them to Jesus. He knew they were there long before you did. He already knew that they were there, and Jesus died for that too. So take them to Jesus and receive his peace. And you may wonder, how long do we need to lament? How long? Well, I want us to think of other wrongs in our culture. You think of, of abortion, the horrible tragedy of abortion. How long should we lament that? Well, as long as it keeps going on, we should lament that. We think of, the, of lamenting the confusion so many people in our culture are feeling about their sexuality, where many of them think that the resolution to my issues I'm struggling with is to find my identity in a transgender type of, a, of an identity. How long should we lament that? As long as it's going on. 
But as long as we lament these things and every time we lament, whatever it may be in our culture that we need to lament, we need to lean forward and look toward the end of time when Jesus will make all things right and new and rejoice that Jesus isn't going to leave things the way they are, but we lament with hope. We lament with hope and expectation that Jesus is going to make all things right and new. And that's why we lament, yes, but we never lament without hope because we believe that the Savior who walked out of an empty tomb, that he is just as he was raised to life, he will raise us to life. And when he does, to that new life, when he does, he will make all things right and all things new.